morning. Uh, most of you know me, but I'm Michael Stetzler, and uh, I have been working with the Mental Health Connect Connection uh, since the beginning, and this forum is about mental health and how we are uh, viewing it and welcoming people with mental health disorders as a community safe. Um, you might notice that we've got kind of a weird setup here. You know, we're, we're trying to get discussion groups, and I forgot to tell people we needed round tables, so we're kind of getting through. Also, you see some people that are placed in here kind of deliberately among you, and that's because we want to have one of the members of our Mental Health Connect team uh, at every table. Uh, we're going to do a lot of discussion today. Uh, so we've been with Mental Health Connect for over two years now, and uh, I'm going to uh, introduce the members of our team that are here. Uh, we have the uh, Liz Vox, uh, Joe, and Kyle. You want to raise your hand there? I think most of you know them. Uh, we have uh, my wife Susan back there, Susan Hurlbutt. Um, we have the Reichman, so we've got Marilyn over here with uh, Scott Tenson from Sofa. We got Bob uh, back there at that table, uh, and I think that's it for the current members and me. A uh, number of people that couldn't be here for one reason or another: Esther Tapley, uh, um, Debbie Jorgens, of course, and she's off on a vacation, and uh, Gary, Gary. Gary Olson and Jean. And Diane Larson. And I think that's it. But anyway, um, this program is about learning from each other. So a lot of this is going to be devoted to discussion. But to kind of kick off the program, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, our preacher for this morning, Hannah. the Reverend Hannah Campbell Gustafson. Uh, those of you at the first service know that she had a terrific message about mental health and a, a new take on the scripture. Uh, Hannah is the new executive director of Mental Health Connect, and she will talk a little bit about that in our partnership and a little bit how she sees community of faith as instrumental in uh, the world of mental health. Yeah. You're going to get our guys here. Huh? Yep. Okay, good morning again. I think I. Uh, so, again, uh, because I'm not sure who, uh, who was in worship this morning or not, um, or who will be in the next service, I'll just introduce myself a little bit more. You gave a great introduction. But um, so I'm Hannah. I'm ordained in the United Church of Christ. I am uh, have a master's of social work. Um, I'm married to Craig, who's a, an ELCA float chaplain for Ebenezer Assisted Living. So he's at seven different sites around. As far as Red Wing, um, we have a, an almost six-year-old Leona and almost three-year-old Ruth uh, and live in South Minneapolis. Um, I think that's that's the brief overview of me. Um, Michael mentioned that I'm the new executive director at Mental Health Connect. I'm coming up on a year, so I feel like soon I will not be as new, but I am still I am still new. Um, and uh, Mental Health Connect, we. We are celebrating 10 years, or 10 year anniversary this year, which is really exciting. So um, just a brief-ish overview on Mental Health Connect. So Mental Health Connect is based out of Bethlehem Lutheran Church, Twin Cities, the Minneapolis campus at 41st and Lindale in South Minneapolis. Um, about 10 years ago, my understanding is, um, there was a church that was closing, I think it was called Epiphany, that was giving away, figuring out how to give away their money. And they approached Bethlehem and said, what would you do around, what more would you do around mental health? So they did a community survey and found out that the big need was help accessing resources. So, um, so that is, let's see. So that is where Mental Health Connect was born. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that access to resource part in a minute. So. Our sort of tagline is collaborate, educate, navigate. So with the collaborate piece, um, we believe that this is work that none of us should be having to do by ourselves and that we, um, so there are, 
we have a collaborative of over 35, I'm not sure of the number, exact number at the moment, but over 35 faith communities. Um, Roberts, Wisconsin is the only one we have in Wisconsin so far, but otherwise we go from Lindstrom to St. Michael, um, sort of, yeah, uh, I'd say the longest I have to drive from South Minneapolis is 45 minutes. So um, that gives you a sense of our, of our spread. And those are all faith communities that are working on education and stigma reduction around mental health. So we really believe that the best way to decrease stigma is to make sure that we are all educated more um, about mental health and about our own mental health, our own mental health. Um, so that's something I really strongly believe in, that it's not, we're not just learning about other people, we are also learning about ourselves uh, so that we know ourselves as beloved by God too, uh, regardless of what our what our mental health might be like at any given moment. Um, so, so that's the collaborative. Uh, those faith communities sometimes do events or programs together. Um, it's sort of, we're still figuring out what the collaborative nature of it looks like, but part of it um, in the last year is that we, uh, I've been convening quarterly gatherings of clergy at all those faith communities to to learn from one another, one another and connect and also um, to support them because we know that over 60% of people go to their faith leaders first if they have questions about their mental health. And um, at least a lot of the faith leaders I know of, they might know of a therapist to refer people to, but they don't know if they currently have openings or if they are the right fit. Um, and people who go to seminary aren't trained, aren't trained as therapists. So um, they can, some, I mean, often provide good pastoral care, but sometimes need to refer people refer people on. Um, so um, the education piece that I mentioned, uh, we have once a month, we have some, uh, we call them ambassador meetings, but they're an education meeting that anyone is welcome to attend on a huge variety of topics. So we had an naloxone training in the fall, um, which is like Narcan, it's an opioid overdose reversal drug. So um, we had that, we've had, I think the one on, well, I know the one on Tuesday is someone who's a mediator, uh, Pastor Michaeline Farrell-Altz from St. Timothy's in Columbia Heights. She's coming to talk about conflict within families that can arise uh, around uh, mental health and mental health crises and how to, how to have healthy conflict. Um, we've had people, yeah, I don't know. I think those are two good examples of that sort of give an idea of the breadth of those education gatherings. They are in person um, at 7 p.m. the second Tuesday or on Zoom. So if you if you ever want to get on our mailing list and just know when those happen, you'd always be welcome to, to come on Zoom or in person. Um, collaborate, educate, navigate. So the navigation piece, I sort of alluded to at the beginning, but we know that the, our health system, navigating the health system or the mental health system is really complicated. Um, I was talking to someone after after worship, I don't think they're here, but who was saying that once they asked for a therapist and it was gonna be six months before they could see someone when they went through their doctor's office. Um, and often that is too long to wait. Um, we, need, we need assistance before that. So we have volunteer navigators who five days a week are answering texts phone calls and emails. Um, they're not a crisis line. Sorry, I mean to always say that at the beginning. If somebody is in crisis, there is a number. I mean, you can call 911 or 988 and those, that's important to know. But if, for instance, you think that you wanna see a therapist but don't know how to find one that takes your insurance and has openings, you can call the navigators and they will ask you some questions and then they will start making phone calls and do often a, several hours of research uh, and then come back to you with an idea of here are some places you might look um, that, and here's a sense of their of the wait list and availability. Um, that's sort of the most straightforward kind of call, but they also, just if someone says, you know, things don't feel right, but I don't know, I don't know what the options are. They can call, you can call a navigator too, and they will ask you more questions, um, listen to your story. They're really good listeners. Um, and maybe talk about support groups or other things that might be available. They get a lot of calls right now from parents of adult children who, uh, um, of adult children who might have some sort of mental health struggles and 
something I'm proud of is that the navigators are good at making sure the person who is calling has the support they need to. So even if I, so if I had a, an adult child living at home with me and I was calling saying, I think my son needs to see a therapist, but I don't know how to get him to do that. The navigators would try to provide some options knowing that that adult child really needs to, is going to have to take the first step at some point, right? But also make sure that I have the support that I need, whether that's a therapist or support support groups or other sorts of resources. So, um, and I'm talking too long, but I'm going to say one other thing about the navigators that I think is really important and unique, which is that they follow up with people. So they will call back or email or text back a week later um, and a month later, and just as long as people want to continue the are willing to continue the relationship. So maybe I've had the experience before of going to a therapist and in the first meeting, I realized this isn't a great fit. You know, I think I need to see somebody else. So the navigators are checking back to see if, if that happens to you and if you need more support. So, so that's sort of uh, not as brief as I meant it to be a description of the work that we're doing at Mental Health Connect. Um, but and now I'm just trying to think about exactly how you worded the second part of your question um, about how how we as communities can be more. Right. I think yeah. maybe, maybe we'll, we'll hold wanna, that. Yeah, piece perfect. Because, because Great. I think the questions that are going to come out of our group are going to kind of tell us where to go. Perfect. Sounds good. Uh, Sorry. I, I mentioned at the outset this is about you guys. Uh, one of the things I've found is that in forums, when we get together in group discussions, we're often coming up with questions that the speakers didn't anticipate and answers that the speakers didn't anticipate. So what I'm going to do is we've got two broad questions that we framed for this forum. And I'm going to ask you to turn to each other in your small group and discuss one or both of these questions. And just have a free-forming thing. Feel free to share stories or whatever and try to concentrate on if, if you have questions to bring back to the whole group, not just to, to Hannah and, and members of our team, but anybody who's got an answer can pipe in when we come back together and have a broader discussion. So the first of these questions is, are we a welcoming faith community how can we be more welcoming? So it's around that question of welcoming. You know, first impressions and how do we, you know, invite people in? How do we act toward people when they're here? So welcome is the first area. The second one is, are we a safe place to talk about mental health issues? And it gets delicate. Uh, those of you who are in first service know that Hannah talked about an experience she had with someone who needed church but didn't feel welcome. Uh, do we know people like that? Have we encountered them here? How do we respond to them? So first question is welcoming, and the question is how do we talk about it? Is it a safe place? Can I talk to you? Can you talk to me about issues that might be in the past stigmatizing? Okay, turn to each other, have a good time. We'll give ourselves 10, 15 minutes to discuss and then regroup. Okay, I see a lot of animated discussion. And I hate to interrupt it, but I'd like you to now bring those animated discussion topics to the whole group. So I think we will start... Uh, with the back table that's paying no attention to me. Uh, so we're, we're going to call on uh, Bob Reichman and or Pastor Peter and or whoever else they designate to tell us what that topic was that was so engaging to all you people. Uh, I, I think he wants to the questions. Um, our group um, uh, shared some of our group shared, you know, firsthand experiences of of, of people in our life. And what what is this question of of, of welcome? Um, I was positing the question at the end there that sometimes welcome is is to, is to acknowledge tacitly who that person is um, and what they're what they're struggling with when they walk through the door um, 
we have to accept it and we have to you know figure out how to accommodate that within the the mechanisms that we have and so the most common time that we gather as a community is sunday mornings worship right and and there's always that sort of wondering uh what happens when the person I'm sitting next to begins to act funny or do something, lash out or act out or, or something along those lines. Um, it's helpful if you know that, that that's their story, right? That there isn't something unusual happening, but it, it is actually something we can expect. And then, it, and then just reassure and to not really respond in a negative way, but maybe respond in a helpful, positive way can be helpful. When, when somebody walks in with a, sprained ankle and they're walking in on crutches everybody is quick to say oh what'd you do what happened you know like we're quick to find out what and experiencing that and then we're like hey well why don't you sit up here in this chair why don't, like we're helping them we're naturally oriented to do that well what if we looked at the people who are walking through the door and expect that they also have <laughs> all of us have an issue and are we prepared to be uh, a good you know, worship participant with them in that moment. Okay, so I've got a takeaway nugget. I'll rephrase what I heard as the essential point, which is that to be welcoming, we need to have a culture that does not make assumptions about people's behavior without knowing their story and accepting of them for who they are without judging them on their behavior. But that's a cultural thing for our community of faith. Next table over here. Let's see. I was there, so I'm not going to report. But uh, who who feels like? Uh, well, we we just we had some good conversation about. Um, what, can, I, can I mention? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a kind of a, a nice history and legacy at, at Prince of Peace, like with Bob and Faith, um, who if you don't know that that they're. Um, their remains are out here in our town area, and Faith Gardner and Bob Tweet, Tweetoff, and they were valued, um, married couple, that they were valued as such an important part of our community for many years, and then, and then passed away, um, you know, here in the last, what, 15 years? Right. Um, Since I've been here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so kind of just that that is kind of just a just a, a nice memory that this this congregation has. And then just we also had some good conversation just about how a lot of the pastors here modeled such good welcoming in in the past. Um that some folks here shared that they, you know, obviously wasn't something that was actually even I so common or every everyday place in other churches where they're, when they're looking for a church home to connect to. And um, um, you know, I, I mentioned I mentioned about even like Peter with the risk with the with you know saying yes to Valerie parking her bus out here. Um, you know, that's not gonna happen every place. Yeah. Quite, um, the, I think we're hearing, and I think there's a common sense in this room that we're pretty welcoming. Nonetheless, there are situations, and Kathy was talking about one of those. Maybe you can just talk. And this is not necessarily our fault, but it's something that it's a dynamic that exists in congregation. I'm trying to remember what I said. Your daughter. Oh, this is, yeah, um, one of my daughters when she grew up here. But after she left, when she came back, she felt treated like a teenager, even though she was an adult with children. Mm -hmm. And that's um, part of the reason she doesn't come here. She's always found a church, but she comes back for special things and things and stuff. But she just wanted to be seen as an adult. And she had enough stuff happen as she was a teenager that wasn't all positive as follow, following through on things and helping with things. And she felt that people didn't see her as a competent adult. And, and my takeaway nugget on that is that once someone feels that you have an image of them that they don't feel is really them, it's difficult for them. 
And once somebody knows that you know they have a mental illness, do they feel comfortable in all their relationships with you? Despite how welcome you might be and how Christian you might be, that happens. And let's see, we'll go over to, uh, let's see, Susan had to leave. Maybe S Steve, can you report on that group or? <laughs> um, I think the um, we talked about the the challenge of of welcoming and how do um, what tools can we utilize or put in place to broaden the sense of welcome, acknowledging at the same time that we're not going to be able to meet everybody's needs. Um, but, but, uh, I talked about a, a large congregation. I served as an associate pastor for a time and depending on who you talk to, it was either the, the warmest, most welcoming place ever, or the coldest, <laughs> most world that you could possibly be part of. And, and the key from my observation was if they came to visit, who did they sit near? Which seems random or or by chance, but there were some people who had developed that sense of welcome and and that sense of of invitation, and and then there were others who it it just didn't didn't seem to work. And how do we broaden? that sense of being able to welcome. Um, Great thought. Don't just shake their hand at the door, <laughs> offer to sit by them at church, suggest going out for coffee later. Bring them after the service, walk with them to the pastor and introduce them. Um, yeah. or, or that. Um, and <laughs> there were some people up there, they had a friendship book people signed when they came to church and there was a whole group that during that immediate following week, they were at their door with a welcome packet. Yeah. They were, yeah. they were, yeah. um, you know, so those were tools that were tried, but you know, people are at such different places that it's hard. We can't, we're unable to be universal. Right. But, um, but we, how can we broaden our our work um and welcome i'll move on to the next group which includes one of our veteran and esteemed welcomers <laughs> ann Hogan, <laughs> who has done that with many many people greeted them at the door but i think we're going to have joe zwak who has been a long time nami member and uh, is probably the senior person here in terms of knowing about the mental health system to report well, I could see you in age too. <laughs> anyway, I've, I've been a member of NAMI for over, almost 40 years and uh, had belonged to, my wife and I had belonged to another church in the area. Didn't feel so comfortable about talking about our son's mental illness. And we decided that we'd check this congregation out because we had visited here in 1957 when we first moved to Roosevelt. And uh, so we came back and met with the uh, interviewing committee, if you want to call it that. And uh, a girl, you, some of you may, may remember Jerry and Deanna Rowe and uh, another couple with uh, their daughter was attended here. She also went to Luther Seminary. Very welcoming people and uh, as I recall, one of the things that was interesting was in the lobby, there was a rack of literature about mental illness. And I uh, didn't see that in the, other, in the other church that we attended. And, and anyway, this lady, when my wife passed away, she was the hostess for the luncheon for my wife's funeral. So all in all, that's the basis of how I feel welcomed at this in this congregation. Thanks, Jill. And the group that let's see, Marilyn, uh, do you have someone else to report or do you want to go ahead? Oh, 
question. That was cut up and it was maybe for Hannah. Um, difference between ambassador and navigator. Mm -hmm. can, can you speak to that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's hold that until we're done with reporting. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll handle it. Generally, I think we felt that our church is a welcoming community. Um, a little discussion about what do you do when somebody's angry? And, you know, you know, kind of the best thing you can do is validate, oh my gosh, yes, I understand. You are angry. Get what's coming, you know, what, what's, where you're coming from on that. And there's difficulty if someone isn't open to discussing any kind of disgruntlement they might have with the church, but, you know, so trying to get folks to talk to each other when, when things aren't going well. And um, especially if someone has a mental health issue, you know, and they're disgruntled. Um, in our group, we shared, um, we have family members that have suffered, you know, are struggling still with mental health issues. And um, one of the things that stood out for me that we were talking about, that Audrey broke, brought up, is it's important to that person that calls the navigator, the, the, the family member of the person who's requesting or needs help, how you also want to, you know, make sure their needs are met. Are they how are they needing you know therapy support whatever even just an ear and that's so important. Um, uh, yeah. Anything else? You know. Okay. okay. And our and our front group. Uh, do we have a reporter here? Okay. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> You feel welcome. <laughs> we talk about small groups a lot and how they are so helpful to really know people and how important it is to be in some of the groups that we are, like the Women on Wednesday, for instance. You know, we have small studies and how important it is to be able to share in those groups. And I think that's how people really become knowing of one another because we can open up and know that it's not necessarily going farther. Um, uh, we, I'd love to see more small groups in this church. <laughs> But I agree with a lot of what Marilyn said that we, I feel, this whole group feels that we are a very welcoming church. With all that has happened in the last year with the settle and with the, you know, openness, I think we all agree that it's a very welcoming church. It's tough to perceive when someone needs you know, some care, some TLC, some mm -hmm. action. So be aware is all, you know, an important thing. Being aware and being being open and letting people know that we do have safe places like groups to share more personal stuff. So let's turn to questions. So we'll start with the question that we got from this group about uh, the difference between a navigator and an ambassador. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so and I don't even, maybe I didn't even mention, or I briefly mentioned ambassadors. So ambassadors are, you can think of them as liaisons between Mental Health Connect and your faith community. Does that help a little bit? So bringing, so coming to things like the ambassador meetings and learning, learning whatever we're learning in that space, and then uh, doing some discernment about if that's, if that is something you want to bring back to your faith community. So like, with the naloxone training that we had in the fall, this is my most present of mind example. Um, after that, uh, some members of some ambassadors from Mayflower UCC went and actually they had a naloxone training at their church last week for their youth group. Um, and so that was, but also ambassadors then sometimes if, if there's a question that is coming up at their faith community or a need, they will then can bring it back to Mental Health Connect. Mostly so that not all of the pressure is on the clergy because there, busy people. Yes. Yeah, so, does it just quick, yeah. quickly that, that within our church, myself, Susan Hurlbut, Gary Olson, and Esther Tatley have 
had that relationship. We've been in some of those meetings, so that's who here are connected. Yeah, yeah thanks. Sorry. That, yeah. He answered my question. Oh, perfect. I was yeah. trying to under, understand whether the people on your committee are automatically ambassadors or you have to kind of take another step. Uh, well, it's, it's kind of loose. Okay. Uh, anybody can sit in on the ambassador meetings and do the learning and bring them back. Uh, there is also a training that's offered. Uh, I haven't actually done the training, but uh, I consider myself an ambassador because of the relationship we've had ongoing. Mm -hmm. There are other questions for uh, me. How many, I know you said at the yeah. first, how many faith communities are you kind of? So I was trying to remember the exact number. It's it's 36 faith communities right now, 38 campuses, but not 36. Yes. Yep. A, a concern in, in our group expressed was addressing youth needs mm -hmm. and the real serious pandemic needs, but also the bullying and, and all that. What does uh, your group do yeah. that specifically targets that? We are trying to figure that out. I think I would say that we that that's something that we're hearing is a is a huge need. Um, we did have a training. I think you maybe have the recording, or if you don't, I can get it to you. But um, a training from someone recently on hope, which stands for healthy outcomes from positive experiences. I mentioned this in our group, but I didn't say it was called that. But about the sort of the research that shows that these are seven things that children need. In their lives that supports their mental well-being and their just their well-being in general into the future um and then yeah i think oh, we are still figuring out how to also be uh supporting if there are children youth and family staff at a, at a faith community how to support them more um we did just apply for a lily endowment grant on monday that if we got it would help us to develop a curriculum to incorporate um, mental health for children into worship lives more. Yes. Uh, one piece I would offer um, too is, is to um, take note that our young people, um, whether it's your kids or grandkids, um, are growing up in a very different world relative to how much we talk about destigmatization, right? The work of, of awareness. The truth is our kids are being exposed to those destigmatization efforts at a much greater rate than we are. Your habits and your social circles and your places are pretty fixed. They're, they're encountering uh, the world in a whole new way. And one of the things you can do is learn from your grandkids, have a conversation with them about mental health and tell me what are you, they teaching you in school or in your youth group or because that is happening and there it's, 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 a, it's amazing. And they'll talk about it in a, this really matter of fact kind of way, which is beautiful because it's saying that they are doing such a much better job of normalizing our responses and the way that we live in community together around these challenges. They all have that classmate. When I grew up, you know, that classmate, we made fun of, and we didn't think of it as bullying, right? We didn't, that kid that was always acting up in the corner or always, you know, whatever, like we, we didn't have that language. We didn't, nobody told us what was going on with that kid. Nobody helped us now the whole class understands and they they talk about how can we support our classmate and how can you know oh it's such a beautiful thing so learn from your grandkids yeah. that's my encouragement to you thank you for that yeah i mean my five my five-year-old in health class they talk about feelings and how to i mean she's been teaching me things about lion's breath and counting your thing i mean breathing with your fingers and all sorts of things that she learned in health class so, wow. yeah they also learn at school a lot about a lot of the schools have buddy benches now where a kid can go sit if they need somebody to talk to and another kid will notice and go sit and talk with them. And we learned something about that when church was a good approach because people aren't gonna just open up and say something. But if you ask if there's something they would like you to pray about for them this week or and kids will respond to that some too and so do adults. So we need let's do a kind of a hard time check here. I, I'm seeing 1035. What do we got? 
Yeah, we, we get a couple minutes. A couple of minutes. Up. Yep. Well, I think just to not put too much pressure on our pastors, we'll have to run and yeah. do something. <laughs> uh, that we will uh, close out now. Would you close us with a word of prayer, please? Mm, yes. Let's pray with me. Loving God, we thank you for our communities and for the places that we feel welcome. We thank you for conversations about how to make sure that we all feel more welcome, uh, how we all can help one another that remember that we are beloved by God, just as beloved by you, beloved, just as we are. Amen. Amen. Amen.